welcome to our class. And uh, we're, if, this is the last little piece we're going to have this week on Parshat Toldot. And we're going to start with the bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav Letzivanu Lasok Bidivrei Torah. And Lauren, I know you'd like to dedicate this class, so please, if you'll explain. Um, just I wanted to dedicate this to the memory of David Bick, who died of cancer yesterday. And he was probably about 60 years old and a very um, talented and, and compassionate doctor, mm. as, as, um, as is his wife. <laughs> Mm. and uh, a very good good person, um, good family, and I guess they're having a funeral today, I'm not sure, but, um, and a close friend of my brother, I'm friendly with his mother, mm. um, of Savannah, Georgia. So our lesson will be Le'ilui <clears throat> Nishmato, for the elevation of his soul. But yeah. we're going to go ahead and, and it, Find the screen. I may have to mess around with this. Yep, looks like I will. Sorry. Okay, let's go in here. <clears throat> Ooh, what happened to the sunshine? When I was out raking leaves at eight o'clock this morning. It's <laughs> here in California now. I guess so, because it is not here. No, it's a, it's uh, another beautiful day in, in Santa Rosa. We've had some really, really, really beautiful days. Well, we're going to have yeah. temperatures near 70, so it's not bad. All right. Day. Let's, <clears throat> we're here, but Akev Esav, right? That Jacob was holding on to the Esau's heel when he was actually delivered. Siman, oh, by the way, I also, in looking this over, the idea of him being complete, right? That his name means complete. Asui is the sort of co connected Hebrew to Esav. And uh, the idea is that he wasn't going to grow spiritually. He was fulfilled uh, physically. He was complete physically, but he never fulfilled himself. He couldn't, he wouldn't grow anymore spiritually. Esav. At any rate, going on here, but Akev Esav, Esau's heel, Siman, right? This was an indication, a foreshadowing. She'ein ze maspik ligmor malchuto, that this one wouldn't complete his reign, his rule, ad sheze omed venotla, before this one arises and takes it away, heimenu, from him. Right, so that's... So the planting, in other words, what we had said said that meant. Vayikrash mo Yaakov, and he called his name Yaakov. And who was the one who called his name Yaakov? Akadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be he. And there's this lovely explanation in this parenthesis. Amar, he, he said, this is God, said, Atim kritun shame. You called your firstborn by a name, right? They called him Esau. I too will call my firstborn son shame a name. And that's implied by the statement by Yikrashmo Yaakov. And he called his name Yaakov. And the reason. Uh, for this, as we sort of try to analyze this a little bit better, is I believe that when it came to Esau, it says they called his name Esau. Vayikra'u, they called his name Esau. And then it says Vayikrashmo, he called his name Jacob. So I don't, see, right. I don't see this in what I have. No, that's the parenthesis. So there must be some additions of Rashi that don't include it. Because okay. of the various additions that, that exist. Okay. Um, trying to think, was there something else? Yes, this is important. <clears throat> what is being set up here is an attitude about reality. And you know, there's that statement in Pirkei Avot that says, to what may this world be compared to a entrance chamber 
uh, a prose door, right? That, uh, and what you should do to the banquet hall. Prepare yourself in the entrance chamber that you may enter the banquet hall. So that there's a very powerful uh, understanding of this life as it not being the be all and end all. And that success in this world is not what's important because we have another world where success really matters. And so you may fail in this world or you may be relatively unsuccessful compared to some who are fabulously successful. But there's a realization that this world, success in this world is so brief, so brief. It's like the flitting of an eye that that to put all one's efforts and one's values into it, which is of course represented by Esau here, is a big mistake. And that what we need to do is to recognize that this world that we live in right now is the one in which we're supposed to try and perfect ourselves through, through the mitzvot, through gemilut chasadim, through these kinds of things. And of course, the fact that money is so important to people and that people's success is judged by their bank account is like anathema to what we're reading here. And it's a very fundamental value that I don't think, I, I think part of the reason it's not really made explicit so much is because people push back at it and they get angry or they can get angry about it. But that really is what's being said here. Davar Acher, another interpretation. Aviv Kara Lo Yaakov, his father named him, called him Jacob. Al Shem Achizat HaEkev. So this is a very sort of straightforward shot here an explanation of this text, that his father, that the reason why it's who, because what's, you know, to, to, you know, Shira Beth mentioned this book that's called What's Bothering Rashi. So you could say that, you know, what's bothering Rashi is that when it comes to Esau, it says they called. And on the other hand, with Jacob, it's he called. And how do you explain that? And so Rashi, first of all, gives us the drush, and then he gives us now the pshat. That simply, it was, it all, all the text was trying to tell us is that his father called him, and that's why it's singular, uh, because he saw how he was holding on to his heel, onto Esau's heel, which I don't know that Rebecca might have seen in that particular place. So it says that Jake, that Isaac was Ben Shishim Shana, he was 60 years old. So how do you sort of account for this, this these these numbers? Yud Shanim Mishenitta Eh, so we talk about the first 10 years where he waited, sorry, he, he held off, he, he, he held off until Rebecca was 13 years old. Remember Rashi has his position about how, how old Rebecca was when Isaac married her. And was now capable of conception. Of becoming pregnant, so he had he waited the ten years, the yud shanim halalu, and these during these ten years, sipa he anticipated, he looked forward to, he longed for the himtin la, and he waited for her, kamosh asa aviv, just as his father Abraham had done the Sarah for Sarah. So in, in mine, it says that this was a further 10 years. So the 10 years that he waited, it's, it, it, I don't get it. It says 10 years passed from the time when he married her until she became 13 years old and capable of childbearing. And then it said a further 10 years, he hopefully waited as his father did in regards to Sarah. Hmm. So maybe it's saying, okay, so I, I, I can explain that. So it's saying he was um, 40, let's see, he was 40. We know he was 40 when he married Rebecca. We know he was 40 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And now it says he was 60 when they were born. So okay. Rocky's explaining the 20 years. So mm -hmm. the halalu, this, this is what it was, where I perhaps made a mistake here, because I said shanim halalu means these additional 10 years mentioned in our current text is what, what, how he's understanding this. And it's quite possible that that's what it means. In other words, the first 10 years, he had to wait for biological reasons. 
but the second 10 years, which made up the 20, he, he, he was hoping, in other words, they were trying to get pregnant during the second 10 years, okay? And okay. he's saying that that 10 years, so Lauren, I appreciate it because that was a, that was a correction of the way I was interpreting it. And I think I, I accept that correction totally. So, yeah, this makes sense. So he was trying after that, but yes, he was. waiting with hope. It wasn't right. happening. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just as his father, just as his father mm -hmm. did for Sarah. Right. But, but when she did not become pregnant, he recognized the fact that she was actually barren. I mean, prior to that, he would have had no way of knowing. And it's saying, you know, Sometimes it takes 10 years, you know, for the for that. They hit Palel Aleha. So now he prayed about for her. The Shifcha. Okay, period. Part of the part of the issue here is that there knows there are no punctuation marks. That's period right here. The Shifcha Lor Ratsa. So now that we've introduced the idea of him following in Abraham's footsteps, the next question that we should be asking ourselves or would be asking ourselves is, well, wait, what did Abraham do? He took Hagar, Hagar. right? He mm -hmm. took a man. And it says, and he did not want to take a, he did not want to marry a handmaiden, the fish and Nitzadeh, because he had become sanctified, Bahar, and that's got to be Mohamoria, right? Mm -hmm. The Mount Moriah, Liot Olat Lima become a perfect um, burnt offering, you know, or, you know, sacrifice. So the fact that he was put on the altar like that, even though he was never slaughtered, thank God, uh, he already had that status. And we'll be reading again that there's another famine in the land, there are all these parallels, and God tells him not to go to Egypt, I believe. In the next in the next thing and again the reason why is because as an olat mima he cannot set foot out of the land of of israel right he can go yeah. up but not down <laughs> onwards the lads grew up then esau was a person who knew the hunt, who experienced the hunt, Ish Sadeh, a man of the field. The Yaakov, but Jacob, Ish Tam, was a simple person, a simple man, Yoshev Ohalim, dwelling in tents. So really, again, this contrast, this essential contrast that we have. All right. <clears throat> Take a look at the Rashi. Yeah, it's a nice Rashi. It is a nice Rashi. Esav, and the lads grew up, and but and but Esau and Esau. So, in other words, this and Esau uh, clause is a continuation, or at least is that they grew up and then Esau, sort of like that. In other words, here's how Rashi is going to explain it explicitly. As long as they were little children, the, of the time they were little children, they were not recognized by their deeds. In other words, essentially it's saying they were identical. They, they lived very similar lives in their characters and personalities and things. They were, they were together. The Ain Adam Midat Beg by him. And it's interesting. I mean, Rashi may be making a little bit of a different point here because he's saying, and a person doesn't look closely at them, doesn't regard them carefully, Mativam, what their character is. Well, we know with very, very young children, I mean, they all have personalities, but how those personalities ultimately develop is, is not a foregone conclusion. Uh, children are very changeable in some ways, or as my sister, my middle sister would say, uh, they're very stagey. But once they became 13 years old, this one separated off to the houses of study, 
Avodat Elilim, and this one separated off to idol worship. Mm. So what is your day at, sorry, did somebody want to comment on this? I or? just don't have any of that in here. I just have one, just one little Rashi about dwelling in tents. Interesting. I don't know why. This is not in parentheses. So it could be, an, uh, again, you know, maybe just a different text they're using, but I think this is a fairly, you know, I, I haven't looked at every single edition of Rashi that I have, but I, I, this does not sound, the stuff in parentheses I understand, but why this would have been left out, I don't know. And it's, it all sounds pretty like, like the kind of stuff Rashi does. Your day at Sayed, experienced of the hunt, experienced in the hunt. So this is, again, remember how this, we had that sort of very significant Rashi as to why, why Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel, that, 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 that Jacob essentially was conceived first, his, his egg fertilized before Esau's, uh, you know, that particular issue and how the fact is that Jacob really was the Bechor, but not the way they were born. So here we go. This is to hunt. Very interesting here. Latsud ulramot et aviv befiv. To hunt and to, to trick, to cheat his father with his mouth. In other words, Esau, we, we know about this kind of personality where the words are sweet, but what goes on in the person's heart ain't so sweet. And they try to trick you into trusting them by using words. By the way, I had a, when I was leaving St. Louis, there were some, some uh, business deals that I needed, minor, very minor business deals that I had to take care of. And I'd go to this person, there were more than one person, and they'd say, oh, I'll take care of you, you know, thinking that, you know, you can trust me and I'll, I'll, I'll manage your, you know, I'll make sure I treat you fairly. And I said to my wife, after a few experiences, I said, when they say, I'll take care of you, they mean, I'll take care of me. And believe me, you'll get taken care of in the negative and ironic sense. So there's certain phrases that people use that I am now, my, my, you know, my ears perk up or my hair starts to stand when I hear them use these phrases. And one of those phrases is, I'll take care of you. Another one is, uh, well, it was what was said at the Republican convention uh, five years ago, only I can save you. You wanna run like the devil. You wanna run and run away. Somebody says, only I can save you. God help you. All right. So give, Rashi now gives an example again. You know, this business of giving a dog a bad name and hanging him, you know, if you're going to say that he, that we're going to understand this knowing the hunt, experiencing the hunt, and we're saying, well, by hunt, we mean, you know, hunting out people, hunting out his father, you better give me an example. So here's the example. Usha Allah, and he said to his dad, Abba, daddy, hey, ah, ma'asrin et hamelach, how does one tithe salt, the et hateven, and straw. How do you tithe salt and straw? And the reality is that you don't tithe straw or salt. So, so when he's asking, well, how do you tithe salt and straw? It's like, oh my gosh, here's a person that is willing to tithe uh, something that you don't even have to tithe. Gosh, how pious they are. His sabur aviv, so his father was had the impression or had, was convinced that Esau is really punctilious about following mitzvahs, you know, getting down to the, the even mitzvahs that you don't have to do. He's so concerned about following mitzvahs. And this is from the Tanchuma, from the Midrash Tanchuma. A man of the field. So, Rashi says, it's what it says. He, he was out in the field. Adam, a person, batel, he doesn't do a job. He's not someone who's, who's he's sort of at leisure, sorder, and he's out hunting the kashto with his bow, chayot ve'ofot, 
animals and birds. So we know that at least in general within Jewish tradition, hunting, being a hunter, when you're really basically, um, where some of it's the sheer pleasure of killing animals, of outwitting animals and, and, and killing them is not a Jewish value. It's considered the value of Esau. So how about Jacob? Um, simple. This is interesting. He has no expertise in any of these things. What is, what is in his heart is in his mouth. Open long is open song, is what they say in Yiddish. They, they, you know what they're thinking. You know what they say because they're saying it. So, someone who isn't uh, super good at, um, at cheating, Karuitam, is considered simple. <laughs> I remember there was a show about these monkeys that said that they were smart enough to know how to cheat each other to steal from each other. I mean, the saddest, saddest part is that some of the stuff that goes on on the internet where people are cheating takes a lot of intelligence to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And look at where they're directing their intelligence. Imagine to yourself, if their hearts were in a different place, what good they could do in this world. And so I think it really does start with a person's heart. And the rest of it just sort of follows with the intelligence that we have. Yoshev Ohalim, remember it said he was a dweller of tents. Eholo shel shem v'oholo shel aver. The tent of shame and the tent of aver. And we That's already- That's the only one I had. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, what can I say? It's good we have this class, right? I mean, that's a lot of good stuff to leave out. So the tent of Shem and the tent of Aver is basically, when it's referring to that, they, they according to sort of this folk tradition, were, uh, they, they were the equivalent of rabbis and they had yeshivas. So they studied. And I realize that that expression is anachronistic, but I don't find it unbelievable, okay, or past belief that people, there were people who wanted to meditate and wanted to think deeply about life. I don't think that's something that just happened in the last thousand years or 2000 years. I think that they've always been people who would ask themselves, you know, why, what is this life about? Why are we alive? Why did we come into this world? So I think this is where I'm happy to open this up. I'm gonna stop the share and let, let you, if any of you have any thoughts or comments, I would love to hear them. Yeah, Golda, yeah. Um, I see um, a, a correlation between Esau, Ishmael and Abel. Abel or Cain? Cain was the tiller of soil, correct? Ah, uh, yes, he was. And but, Abel, Abel, Abel made the made the sacrifice of 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 a sheep yes, or a something. He was not a hunter. He was not a hunter. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe hunter. not Abel, which is fine. Uh, and I've and I've kind of thought about that in my head too. That that okay. might not work, but um, that's okay. But we haven't really talked about hunters except for correct. Uh, we did one time, remember? I think Nimrod was known as, and I think they used that keyboard Sayed. Oh, okay. I don't and, think I was working with you when that. No. no. Okay. Back in Genesis, and we wouldn't have even touched it because we get, okay. so, as you can see, how much of this we managed to actually yeah. get into is very. Yeah, nice. I flip back and forth when we're when we're doing this, and right. then then yeah, and then yeah. But this, so, this so that you know because they're because you know so they're they're like they're like they know how to live out in the world out in the the wilderness they can they can still do what they need to do and still survive well there we go i think you just hit the yeah. word hit the word right. which is you know that the term survivor has more than one connotation attached to sure. it sure 
there's there. good and bad, but okay. yeah. Correct. Yes. No question about it. And there's there's a there's the idea of using your wits, right? And how right. do you use your wits? Do you use them because you want to kill things? Do you use your wits to hurt people, to yeah. trick people, to cheat people, or do you your, use your wits to show people, you know, maybe secrets that they need right. to know to survive and what have you, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Absolutely. The parallel between Yishmael and Esau is significant, is significant. Mm -hmm. and not only that, that's a, but there is a difference as well. And that is that there's an understanding about Yishmael that in the end he does tshuva. Whereas with Esau, yeah. there, is, there is not that sense. Even though, of course, we see some reconciliation going on. But yeah. we'll get back to um, Vayishlach to the part. Yeah, we don't know what would have happened next because Jacob ran away. Right. <laughs> we he, don't he, know he, for sure. He he very respectfully uh, yeah. said to Esau, I, "I can't follow you." You know, I don't. I'll want see you me. later. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and these things I want to tell you parenthetically also give me trouble at times. And I sure. want to be able to, because I, I don't, I want to feel that, and I, because I believe it, that Judaism, while I love Judaism, while I love the lessons and the, and the philosophy it bears, I am not into triumphalism. I, I dislike triumphalism. You know, what is hateful to you, don't do to your neighbor. I don't right. like when other, when other religions act in triumphalistic ways. So therefore, I should not be triumphalistic. And, um, and so these kinds of passages, which can be understood in the Torah as sort of implying triumphalism, bother me deeply. Uh, and I, I work very hard to show how they can be interpreted in a way that is not triumphalistic. Well, I see it as a an evolution uh, yes. from from here to Hillel. You okay. know, it's like yeah, it takes okay. time to 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 come to that realization. Maybe so. On the other yeah. hand, I, because I have such an, I I assume I make this assumption that the Torah has all the wisdom there, and it's a question of how you mine it out, right? Mm -hmm. Is that so? There are so it's there. And in a way, it's checking your heart. In other words, if your heart's in the right place, you'll interpret it in a way that isn't going to lead you to triumphalism. And I think that assuming that other religions, formal religions, practice idolatry, I think is unfair. And comparing, say, Christianity and Islam or, or Buddhism or other, you know, Hinduism as the kind of idolatry that they're talking about in the Torah, I think is making a mistake. And I mm -hmm. think people who worship money actually are the idolaters. But then having this sort of anathema that comes out of the Torah, I think the anathema is to idolatry and not necessarily to the idolaters. Okay, and nor do I want to go around labeling people. I don't want to do that. I, again, these are things that I find very disturbing and and ugly, mm -hmm. and, and and unhelpful. I, by the way, and unhelpful. And I yes. need to say something about Buddhism. There is no God in Buddhism. There's um, there are statues um, of people but they don't, they're not worshiped just as we have, you know, artistic representations of different people over our history. So, um, but Buddhism has no gods before them, period. And right. all is one, period. Yes. Just wanted to say that. I, I understand. So the way, I, and, and thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I, my understanding is that Whenever, whenever you really start to look into what it means to believe in God, right? It's, it's so unclear. So there's like a spectrum. And on the one side of the spectrum, you have Buddhism that doesn't want to talk, even talk necessarily about one supreme deity, because from the Buddhist perspective, you're already off the mark there. On the other hand, you have Christianity that is willing to have a human being 
be divine in the term in terms of how you know how Christianity, at least since the Nicene, the Council of Nicaea, you know, determined the nature of Jesus. And certainly there are things like that implied in the New Testament. And somewhere in the middle, you have Judaism, where we have a God, but that God has absolutely no representational form that, that is a meaningful thing, right? And you have, is, you have Islam as well, where you don't want to have any kind of representational art. And, and my sense is that it has more to do with human psychology and levels of comfort and culture and things like that, because you're dealing now with subjects that on some levels are ineffable. And, and so I'm not saying that there isn't a level of fetishism that you can wind up with, but I'll be honest with you. I think there's fetishism in Judaism when we are kissing the Torah, but we don't do what's it, written in the Torah. When we do, when, when you look at what the Torah contains and you don't you don't at least make an attempt, right? It's not a question of whether you do every single thing, but at least in principle, you want to try and respect the Torah and what's written in it, but, but you're there kissing it, but you haven't, you don't, you've never read it. You've never looked at what's inside of it. To me, that's fetishism. That, or should I say, and, and the trouble is what I'm saying now is very rough and, mm -hmm. and, and, and painful and cruel in some ways. And I don't like to say it. I mean, mm. uh, but I like your interpretation, and I thank you very much for being so um, transparent and authentic with what you think and you feel, and you're willing to transmit because it stimulates thought. Thank you. And and but Buddhism does believe in gods, but it doesn't believe in a monotheistic creator god. It does not believe in gods. Yeah, there, it does. There are attributes of mm. different uh, people. They're, they're, they're called deities. You know, it's just, they're, they're, they're not the same as what we believe. It's the um, samsara teachings and it's um, the, the D-E-V-A devas. They're, mm. they're deities. They're just not... Do like they, a, okay. a big, giant, powerful, monotheistic creator god. L Lauren? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't believe in God. Semantics. No, no, Maybe no. More like angels. They're, they're just like we believe in, um, you know, Moses having done certain things so that we, um, you know, his attributes and certain well, other... Mo Moses isn't a deity, though. Well, prophet, I... Okay, this is I think it's really requires it's careful. Also, Lauren, it, you and I will talk about it. Yeah, it requires careful analysis. Okay, Lauren, I had heard that 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 Buddhism was an atheistic religion. Okay, and I, I my understanding from that was similar to Lisa's on that. And, I think, and, and likewise, just let me if I can try and express this. Yeah, uh, I don't think that's accurate, though. Okay. And, I it, think and it may not be, and it may not be, and it yeah. may need to be clearer about it. All mm -hmm. right. Uh, I remember there's in that great book. There's a book about where the Jewish, where these people go to Dharamsala. The to Jews explain, and the, Lotus, the Jew yes, and the Lotus. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, I think there's a story in there, or it's in its sequel. There's also a sequel to that book where this guy is accusing Buddhism, you know, he's talking to some Buddhist Lama about all the various representational gods, quote, quote, and the Lama says to him, that's meaningless. He says, we don't really think there's any intrinsic power to these things. And he takes one of these statues, right? And he smashes it in front of him to prove that it's not that. So the question is, I think, if I could try and, and be helpful, try to be helpful, is that when, w w that when we sort of look at these things as deities, how do we understand deity there in mm -hmm. contrast to how we understand, you know, deity when it comes exactly. to- Exactly, it's a completely yeah. different type of concept. It's not an omniscient, it's not an omnipotent, uh -huh. it's not yeah. immortal, it's yeah. not, you know, right. All, right. all moral, it's not, it's not the same concept as uh, of right. a monothelic, monotheistic god at all right but i want to say one more thing about what you said Mordecai. Or even a Greek god. it's not it's not atheistic mm -hmm. i i disagree that it is atheistic yes it's i believe I, 
Yeah, I polytheistic, do. but I don't believe it's semantic, it's but I do believe that there's a Western um, kind of popular thought about it that sees it as atheistic because it doesn't have the type of God that we consider God. You know, it, people wouldn't call it, right. call him, you know, Buddha's not a God. Right. But exactly. Buddha, no, no. I think he's, but, a and, he's a deity. Right. So it's 806 or 1006 your time. Mm -hmm. that you have to get started. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in a way, I wish we had an hour to do what we're doing, you know, and that we could actually get through the Parsha, you know, do us uh, an Aliyah. Nah, we through. wouldn't get through it. <laughs> and, way, I'm oh, switching sorry. to Chabad because Chabad has all the Rashi commentaries and Safaria doesn't, so. Okay. okay. Cool. Let me say Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, guys. It's great doing this. And um, I will see you, uh, some of you in another week. Right. Enjoy your week off. So I, yeah. will, I, I will have to try. <laughs> no, do it. Yeah. All right. I sleep. command you. No. Thank you. And I thank God for the fact that we're able to do this. I'm so grateful to be doing this at this point. Would you like to stop yeah. recording hey, us? Uh, yeah, let me stop the recording. Let me stop the recording. Sorry, I gotta find my cursor.